How lovely is your dwelling church. The Bible tells us that the Lord inhabits the praise of his people. The Bible also tells us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God dwells in us and with us. So this morning, I would invite you to ask the Lord to come and dwell here with you today that you would be expressing praise to him from what he places within you because you are incapable of praising him without his presence in you. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit, to not only reveal truth to our hearts and lives, but to enable us to glorify him and praise him and celebrate who he is. So God, today as we gather here, we recognize your presence we recognize that you are here with us in this place, but you are not limited to our place here, Lord. We thank you that you gather with brothers and sisters in Christ around the world today, that there is a chorus of praise that goes before your throne from all the corners of this earth, Lord, from its far reaches. And we thank you for your presence, not only here with us, but with all of them as well, because one day we will stand before your throne united together, 
declaring your majesty, celebrating who you are and praising you. So thank you, God, for this taste that we get, these moments we get to share here. And would you encourage us in our hearts today as we celebrate you? In Jesus' name, amen. Rolls up his sleeves, the angels putting on the wrists. Our God is an awesome God. There is thunder in his footsteps, lightning in his fists. Our God is an awesome God. The Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, so you'd better be believing. Our God is an awesome God.
As we pray together this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. If you read my email that I sent out this morning, I gave you some notice of a new song that we were going to sing today. It's a song of giving God the glory, even as we've prayed for his kingdom to come, his eternal kingdom. We get to reflect even now on what we're going to hear when we get there. The Bible tells us about angels gathered around the throne singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and who is to come. Our declaration now of God's holiness is our recognition of who he is and our recognition of where we stand before him because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And taking all of our sin on himself, he has wiped our slate clean when we ask him to, when we come before him and declare him as our savior, as our Lord, as our redeemer, when we ask him for his forgiveness, the Bible tells us he is faithful and just and purifies us of all our unrighteousness so that we can, in holiness, declare God as holy. thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and possessions your name stands above them all and the
Yesterday, the, uh, the elders uh, and I had the opportunity to go and gather over at Mission Creek Alliance Church uh, with other leadership teams from other Alliance churches uh, in our region and area here from Revel Stoke right uh, down through to Oliver. And uh, it was a good opportunity to be encouraged in, in terms of direction and in leadership and what, uh, what it all entails to serve in leadership and to work together uh, as a team. So I want to want to thank uh, the elders for taking that time to be there with me yesterday. And for those of you that might not, uh, you know, remember or recognize what they all look like, you do see them up here on communion Sundays, but just so that you can see them here again this morning and know that um, if you need to call someone to come and pray with you, or you want to just speak to someone of what's going on in your life, you know, please don't hesitate to give them a call. Uh, so we got Doug Stimson. Uh, just stand up for me, guys. Doug, we got Terry Bates, we got Mike Michaud, and Caleb Enns, and they are currently serving as your elders board along with me. And uh, so I just um, pray for them. Pray for wisdom and guidance and direction. Pray that, uh, that God would anoint them with, with his picture and vision for, for our church and for what God would call us to do. And so I just invite you right now while they're standing, um, would you gather around them right now where you are? We're going to pray for them this morning. So would you just, where you are, if you want to stand up around them, just extend a hand on them. If you don't want to move from your seat, just extend a hand toward them. We're just going to pray God's blessing on them as, uh, as they lead and, and bring guidance and direction and spiritual leadership for the church. Lord, this morning we recognize, uh, Jesus, when you were on this earth, you picked a lot of people to serve in leadership, not because of their resume, God, but because of what you saw in their hearts. And then you worked in them and you transformed them and you 
develop them to be the leaders that would lead the church. And today, Lord, we take that same direction that you gave to your disciples, and we ask, Lord, that you would extend your hand and reach upon the hearts and lives of these men that serve us here in leadership. Thank you for their heart to serve. Thank you, Lord, for their heart first and foremost for you, their desire to live their life for you, God, and to honor you with their life. And so, Lord, I just pray for them. I pray for their marriages. I pray for their families. Pray, God, that you would support them, you would encourage them, that you would protect them, that you would watch over them, that you would give them wisdom and guidance and counsel, Holy Spirit, to to lead. And Lord, we recognize that the leading is your leading through them. So come today, we pray, and just anoint them. Give them a picture, Lord, of what our church needs to be and how we can live together in fellowship. And Lord, when they need to make decisions, would you give them discernment and give them direction in how to best lead? Thank you for them, Lord, and we just uh, pray for them right now knowing that they need you. So give them an extra measure of you today, God. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. <coughs> while, we, um, while we sit here in comfort in our chairs and our quietness and our peaceful parking lots and everything else, there's a world going on out there. And uh, the emails that flood in, whether it's from Jews for Jesus or for Israel or for the Ukraine, recognize that there are wars going on in our world today. The true war that is going on in the world today, even when we look at the world and we see drones and bombs from Iran heading towards Israel, just pick up your Bibles, folks. You can see that it tells us all about what's going to happen, but it also tells us that God's got it that he is sovereign and in charge and control, and that Israel will not get wiped out by any attack from Iran. In fact, it's going to get worse, not better. What we can realize and recognize in that is this. The story is all unfolded for us here in God's word. And there will be huge unrest in the world that grows until one comes that seems to make peace on this earth, and he will be the Antichrist. And he will come and direct it to peace with Israel. And as Revelation reveals to us, there will be this earthly peace and calm for three and a half years. And then things will really hit the fan. And the world will go sideways. And God's destruction and wrath will be poured out on this earth. And we will see an end that comes. The reality we have to know in our hearts. And that we need to count as a blessing is this. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today you won't see any of that because Jesus is going to come first. And he's going to call his bride home, the church, those that have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But for any that do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you will see great and amazing and horrible and terrible things take place here on this earth. Our place and our measure today is yes, to pray for the circumstances of our world. We've been directed to do so by God. But for a purpose, as Jesus declared, and this gospel will be preached to all nations, and then the end will come. So what we need to pray in these moments is that the men and women and children and families and soldiers and all those engaged and involved will come to see and recognize and know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Because there is no doubt that God's sovereignty is reigning and ruling already in those parts of the world. We just need him to reign and rule in the individual hearts of the people that are there. And there are men and women there on the ground. In the Ukraine, in Israel, in Gaza, in other nations that are in unrest. There are men and women on the ground that are boldly proclaiming and living out the truth of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And we need to uphold them in prayer. We need to be encouraging them and supporting them and praying for them that God's presence, his protection, his wisdom, his guidance will be with them during these days and hours because they are living it out on the front lines day by day. Some of you know of people in those countries 
You know of people that are serving. You also know of people that here within our own country are ministering to those who have been refugeed or evacuated from the war-torn areas of this world. On Tuesday morning, we often get updates from Tony of Pastor Andre, who was a refugee from the Ukraine, who came here to Canada and has now set up a church in Abbotsford, and the church has grown so large, they're separating to become two churches in Abbotsford and Langley because there's a hunger for the truth of Jesus Christ. You will see in the days to come an increase in the hunger for Jesus and also an increase in those who vehemently oppose and stand against the truth. Where will you stand? What is your position today? What do you hold to and what truth do you uphold and live out in your life? And who are you reaching with the message of Jesus Christ? Let's pray. God, in our world today, there is much unrest. I don't envy the world leaders, Lord, as they have to make decisions that affect the lives of countless people. But Lord, we do pray today. We pray, Lord, for the hearts and lives of your chosen people, Israel. That their hearts would be melted, Lord, that the stone would become flesh, that their eyes would be opened, that they would see you, Jesus, and recognize their need for you and that the Messiah has already come. Lord, we do look as well to the Ukraine that has been embattled for over two years now. Lord, would you... Continue to work in their midst, Lord, as we've heard stories of many that have come to know you as Lord and Savior. There is still a message that needs to go forth. And Lord, when we look at our own country and we look at the almost complacent way we live in our peace, Lord, would you disturb us? Would you cause us to a place of some unrest where we remember that we need to rely on you and not on what we see in this world? And Lord, would you direct us to see our neighbors and our families and our coworkers and people that do not know you as Lord and Savior, Jesus, would you cause us to see them with your eyes? Would you also give us the heartache of knowing that if they don't know you, Jesus, their eternal destiny is hell. So give us a heart that breaks for those around us, that sees them in need of you, and then, Lord, give us voice to speak and address this world. Be with the international workers and missionaries, the pastors, the teachers, who even today in the areas of the world that we aren't are ministering for you, often at cost of life or the threat of it. Watch over and protect them, we pray, Lord, as they declare your truth, and may your truth, God, ring forth. Holy Spirit, open eyes, open ears, open minds to hear your truth and to recognize the need for you. For God, we here too have all sinned and fallen short of your glory. And we needed Jesus just as they need Jesus. May you receive the glory and honor from our lives and our testimony. Amen. You can take note of announcements for this week in your bulletin and uh, see the upcoming events. Uh, Move to Inspire Women's Fitness is back on for this week on Tuesday. There's a seniors gathering on Thursday, young adults Wednesday night. And uh, this last Wednesday, we had a great engagement with the, with the youth out front. It was a superhero day and Spider-Man showed up. And uh, we, we had a question up that said, who is your superhero? And the group that hands out the Bibles every week uh, from the Gideons, they were out there and they had some, some papers and directions that were challenging people to accept Jesus as their superhero and, uh, and to recognize that and some really good conversations there. If you are sitting here today and you're thinking, I don't know how to share Jesus with somebody, I encourage you to come out on a Wednesday afternoon between 3.15 and 4.30, and the group that leads in handing out the Bibles and sharing Jesus with these kids would love to mentor you and direct you to do that, and you could engage with this ministry, not just here, but in our community of sharing Jesus with others. And I encourage you to take part in that. Next Sunday, we invite you to come join us for the service in the morning, and uh, we will be having communion next Sunday, and then we will also commune together over a soup and bun lunch. 
So uh, the ladies will be preparing a soup and bun lunch uh, for next Sunday. So plan to stay here after the service and join us. And then the following Sunday, we have the Kelowna Community Gospel Choir coming to join us at 6.30 in the evening and uh, invite you to not just come yourselves. Out in the foyer on the tables, you'll find some invites. We've uh, distributed posters throughout our community, and uh, we ask you to take an invite. Invite someone to come. They are called the Kelowna Community Gospel Choir because in the songs and the declaration of their singing, they will present Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we invite you to come for that as well. If you're new and visiting with us here today, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to see us as part of our family here at Westside. Two things you need to know about our Sundays. Number one, we don't pass an offering plate. We just keep a clay jar beside the door. And I thank you all for your faithfulness in your giving of your tithes and offerings to support the ministry here. And secondly, we value fellowship. We value that bond of friendship that we have to share life together. And so we take a break in our service every Sunday for 15 minutes so that you can engage with one another. There's coffee and juice prepared. There's books in the library that you can check out or you can just visit with one another. Or maybe during this time, it's the only time in the week where you're going to have to just sit quietly. There'll be music playing here in this room and you can just sit here and quiet yourself. And then when the music starts, invite you to come back in and join us as we open up God's word together this morning. We'll see you in 15 minutes.
power of darkness comes in like a flood. The battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor.
And God, we thank you that you are here in this place, that you see our hearts, that you engage with us. We ask now, Holy Spirit, that you would engage our hearts as we open your word for your honor and glory. Amen. Please be seated. To take your Bibles out this morning. If you do not have a Bible and like one to follow along with, please slip up your hand and one of the ushers will provide one to you. If you're just joining in with us this morning, we, uh, we've been on a study of the book of Revelation. And uh, in that journey, we have seen God's glory revealed in Jesus Christ in his letters to the churches. We've seen God's wrath revealed (coughs) as he pours it out against the sin of mankind. And you often wonder today, why doesn't God just step in right now? Why doesn't he just jump right in? He could do it right now, snap of a finger, one word from his mouth. All the evil, all everything could be removed from this world because God is that powerful. So why doesn't he do it? It's because of the journey that we are on to him and the journey for everyone else here that he still gives everybody by his grace the opportunity to turn to the right and accept him, that he still gives us that same opportunity And even in the end times, when the tribulation hits and all the turbulence of the world comes in the judgments of God, God's grace will still remain the same as it is today, the same as it has been forever, because God is unchanging. As we started last week, we uh, we started an engagement in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 to 6. And uh, in that engagement, we saw in there this character that appears. He's been there all along, right from the start in Genesis, carried right through. His name is Satan, the devil, the great dragon. He is the enemy of God and of all those who choose to declare their faith in Jesus Christ because we are in a spiritual battle. Each and every person on this planet, is in a spiritual battle. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And last week, if you missed the message, uh, we talked about his origins, his history, his names, how he uh, engages us. We also came to recognize, as Romans 8 declares, that we are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. We've been given the full armor of God to protect us, as Ephesians 6, 10 to 18 tells us, so that we can stand against the schemes of the devil. Here's the reality, church. If God tells us that we can stand against the schemes of the devil, it means it's a reality, it's a possibility, and it's founded on God. That's why it's on the armor of God, not what we make for ourselves or what we contrive to do. And so today we are going to take a second look at public enemy number one. Had someone come up to me today and say, well, is this message different? Is it public enemy number two? And, and, and it was a great little mini conversation because you know who public enemy number two is? Ourselves. That's public enemy number two, mankind. Public enemy number one, though, it's a spiritual battle that we have to walk through and, and face today. And today, as we begin to look at this, we need to remember, first of all, that this battle didn't just happen upon us now. It's been going on through time. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, we see the serpent as he tempts Adam and Eve in the garden and says, come eat this fruit that God said don't eat. God, did he really say that? 
The tempter has come. Temptation. It's this aspect of our life. Anyone here ever not been tempted? See, that was a great question, wasn't it? Anybody here been tempted? If you didn't put your hand up, you're lying. Okay? But throughout the Bible, we get these stories over and over again of the fact that mankind falls and is succumbed by the temptations around them. From Achan's sin, stealing things from Jericho when they conquered Jericho, to Samson getting tempted by Delilah. Oh, Samson, you're so strong. Okay? To David not doing what he's supposed to. In the spring when kings go off to war, he stayed behind. It got him in trouble. And then we got Elisha's servant, Gehazi, who when Naaman comes and seeks healing, goes after him afterwards and chases him down for a couple bags of silver and some cloaks, and his reward at the end of it was leprosy. Right? Just because Jesus came along in the New Testament didn't mean temptation stopped. Peter was tempted to deny Christ three times. He succumbed to it. Ananias and Sapphira were tempted to misrepresent their financial holdings in giving to the church. They died because of it. The reason we analyze and look at these things, the reason why these stories from Scripture apply to us is because we recognize that behind each one of these temptations is the tempter. The whisperer of woe, the devil, the one who wants to distract, deceive, keep you from living in the fullness of the godliness that God calls us to. The reality, as 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 tells us, though, in the New Testament, is that you are facing the same thing that everyone else does. 1 Corinthians 10 13 says, no Temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. When we come to the Bible and we want to find out some insights about this enemy that we're dealing with, one of the good stories to go to is in the book of Job. You'll find it, if you crack your Bibles to the middle, you'll hit Psalms. Back up one book, you hit the book of Job. Job was and was declared as a man that was blameless and upright. One who feared God and turned away from evil. That's a good thing to say about someone. Good, upright. He obviously had the heart of God in his heart. And the story tells us in Job beginning in verse 6 of chapter 1. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. <coughs> then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is, an, is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And you can read in those next verses what all happens to Job. All of his possessions get stolen and taken away. His kids all get killed off. And then he doesn't turn against God. We're going to pick up the second encounter in chapter 2 with Satan's attack. It says, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? 
And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. All that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And Job took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And if we go back to the first encounter in Job chapter 1, after all that had happened and all that was lost, it says Job arose and tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Today's message is not about Job. We could analyze Job, we could study Job, we could take a look at the response of Job, and and it does play into our conversation when we look at the enemy we face. The aspect that we learn first and foremost from Job is this, God is sovereign over all things. What we also learn in regards to the devil is this, he has limitations, He is not omniscient. He doesn't know all things. Only God gets that claim. He's not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful. Only God gets that claim. And he is not omnipresent. He's not able to be everywhere all the time. Only God gets that claim. So when we compare the enemy with God, we need to remember that only God is God. And there is not a level playing field. It is weighted for all eternity in God's favor because he alone is God. We do see Satan evidenced and engaged throughout the the world through his minions, through his demon horde. We see him engage with Jesus and the apostles. We see in the world of their day, likewise today, we can see around the world in the engagement with missionaries and international workers that evil is rampant and present in all the world. In the temptation of Jesus, Satan took Jesus and said, here's all the nations of the world, bow to me and I'll give them to you. In other words, Satan saying, I'm engaged and involved in all these situations But we need to remember that there are limitations to what he can do in relation to believers. And here's the difference. In regards to all those who do not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're already Satan's possession. You're already destined for hell with him and you're already dead in your sin. For the wages of sin is death. So the limitations for Satan in engaging you, there is none. Unless God steps in and intervenes and prevents him from going against you. The true limitations we need to recognize today are the limitations that he has with regards to those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. First off, as we see in the book of Job, he cannot tempt or even touch a believer except by God's permission. God allows it. In Job, we see this take place. Job 1 here, verse 10 to 12, where he actually says to God, look, if you don't remove your covering or your touch or your protection from him, I can't do anything. And God says, go and do it. 
It says that God removes his hand of protection from Job and allows Job to do it. In the New Testament, if we turn to the book of Luke, in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, there's an absolutely fascinating verse that comes in here during the Lord's Supper. Luke chapter 22, verse 31 says this. This is Jesus talking to Simon Peter. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Satan said in this spiritual realm, hey, let me have at Peter. Let's test him out. Let's see what's going on. Let's see if he's really going to be this solid rock Jesus that you've named him Cephas. And Jesus says here in verse 32, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now, if you know the story of Peter and you know what happens with Peter, Jesus says, you're going to deny me. Peter says, no, I'm not. Jesus is here before he even does it saying, Peter, I get it. You're going to deny me, but I'm praying that your faith does not fail. In the midst of the temptations, in the middle of what you face, that your, the temptation will not drive you to lose your faith and your hope. And then he even encourages him and says, and when you have turned again. You know, we get to see this from the hindsight picture. It's 2020. We can understand it all. But how many times in the midst of the moment in our lives are we in that same Peter situation and we can't see the forest for the trees, and we don't really understand what's going on, and we don't recognize the spiritual battle that is going on. Likewise, in the book of Job, it illustrates to us that Satan cannot inflict sickness except by God's permission. Now, there are sicknesses in our world that are just the result of sinful nature and mankind and sickness and depravity. But there are also sicknesses that come upon people because they are spiritual in nature and spiritually founded, and you have actually had an attack of sickness that comes upon you because the devil has inflicted sickness. But that does not happen, again, except by God's permission. And in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, I'm testing out your sword drill practices this morning. And again, I'll let you know that I will be sending out an email this week with the scripture passages that we do talk about and look at. Uh, I just want to ask a question this morning, though. Do, do any of you actually take the time to look them up and, and actually spend the time? Okay. I would encourage you to do so, to dig in, to look in the passages, even as we briefly touch on them. It lets you know where in your own Bible these passages are so that you can point to them. And you can highlight them, you can put sticky, colorful tabs on your Bible, whatever you need to do to remember where to go when you're in these circumstances. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it tells us, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he, that is Jesus himself, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil." In other words, the one who right now holds the key on death, even death can be inflicted by the devil. That's why when God told him about handling Job, he said, you can't kill him. You can inflict sickness on him, but you're restricted. There's a limit. In other words, the exception part to all of the engagement of evil in our lives is except by the permission of God. And then you would say, but if God loves me, why does he give permission? Why does God do this? Why does God allow Satan to have license? Well, Romans chapter 5 gives us some insight on this. Because it tells us, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the establishing baseline. Christ our cornerstone. Christ our solid rock. We have faith in him. And through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. In other words, we recognize what we're aiming at. We know what we're going for, and we've got an eternal promise waiting for us because of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, and that hope is that we will one day stand before the glory of God and his throne and be there with him. 
But then it says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. <coughs> so God allows Satan to have some license with us at times. He gives permission at times to remind us to trust in God. To remind us not to trust in ourselves. Because you know the reality of it is we easily lose sight of that some days. God told that to the Israelites in the Old Testament. He said, when you get into the promised land and life gets going good, and you've got the land flowing with milk and honey before you, and you have all the treasures of the earth there, he says, you will forget about me. And how true is it? You know, when our founding fathers first came to this country and sailed across the sea, most of the first settlers that came here were refugees. They were spiritually oppressed people that came here and got to live in the freedom of this land and live for God. But then they got here and life got good. And take a look around you today and see where people's attention and focus is in this world we live in. In what we have wonderfully termed first world living. Well, you've heard it. First world, second world, third world countries. This whole dynamic of, of the world we live in. Well, God also lets us get tested and tried to remind us of our finiteness. When you get sick or you get ill or when you see death take place, you remember that this life we live is birth to death, start to finish. That hyphen on the gravestone is the sum of your life. But most importantly, we're supposed to remember to grow in his grace, in our reliance upon him. You know, the reality is that Satan knows the story better than we do. He's focused on it a whole lot more than we have over time. But just because he has limitations does not mean that he stops trying. <coughs> In 1 Peter 5 verse 8, it tells us that he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking those that he can devour. He also says in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14 and 15 that he masquerades as an angel of light. He doesn't play fair. He wants you to think and do and fall apart in any way, shape, or form that turns you away from trusting in God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving God and trusting his direction. George Partington, in his book, Outline Studies in Christian Doctrine, lists out seven deadly D's of the way that the Satan uses devices to engage us for believers and unbelievers. The first D is diversion. This is a blindedness for unbelievers. He diverts them. You ever talk to somebody and it seems like you can almost see a light bulb going on in their head that they're recognizing their need for Jesus and then all of a sudden it just disappears and their thoughts get diverted and their attention gets put to other things. It's like Peter when he got out of the boat to walk on the water to Jesus and when his eyes were fixed on Jesus, he was solid walking on the water and as soon as he saw the wind and the waves and what was going on in the world around him, he lost sight and started to sink in the waves. Satan will do anything possible to keep people that do not know Jesus from choosing to accept Jesus. He'll make you think you don't have the whole story. He'll make you think like there's secret facts or things that haven't been revealed. He will divert your attention by tragedies or activities or events of this world that can take your eyes off of looking to God and looking to the things of man. He even uses guys like MacGyver to think you can solve everything with duct tape. Okay. <laughs> no, unfortunately, you can't. The second D that he uses is delusion. You will be like God. Wasn't that the statement that he used? That first statement? God's holding out on you. You can be like God. The third is double mindedness. Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 24, that no one can serve two masters. 
You must love the one and hate the other. You can't have it both ways. You can't live for just the treasures of this earth and the treasures of God in heaven. You can't do it for both. But if you live for God in heaven and in his grace, he decides to give you a little extra in this world, that's his choice, not yours. You can't have life both ways. You can't say, God, I want you but my way. It doesn't work that way. He also uses seeds of doubt. He puts questioning. He puts lack of confidence. I, I, I can't go talk to my neighbor. I mean, what if, what if they say no? What if they reject Jesus? What if it ruins a friendship that we might have with our neighbor because I went and talked to them about Jesus? And he puts this thought process in our head that paralyzes us and grips us and this doubt leads us to live in fear and Romans 14 verse 13 verse 23 sorry tells us but whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith but whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. In other words, the, the objective aspect of doubt there, it's talking about food sacrifice to idols and dietary aspects, but it's the same principle. It's, it's our faith that removes doubt. Having doubt is normal. It's not a sin to doubt. It's what we do with the doubt. For years, we've been accosting Thomas as the disciple by calling him Doubting Thomas. You know, Thomas was faithful, Thomas. Thomas just needed a little encouragement in his faith. And what did Thomas do with that faith? He went off and became a missionary to India. And you can go today to the coastlines of India and still see churches and a remnant of the faith of Thomas and the remnant of the people that still love and believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior in that country because of what he did with the faith. He was just saying what everybody else wanted to know and do. See the holes in my hand, touch my side. Understand, I'm not just a ghost, I'm not an apparition. And then Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. We see the picture in words, we have God's word. But we weren't there, we didn't see Jesus rise. Paul talks about 500 witnesses to the risen Christ. We are trusting in their faith in Christ. And we live our lives out in faith, so we don't need to live in doubt and one of the greatest aspects of doubt that he challenges is this. That God could really love you. I mean, if you've done all the things you've done and said all the things you've done, do you think God could really love a person like that? But when we trust in God's word, he says God demonstrates his love to us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with God. In those moments of doubt, sometimes we find ourselves in the next place, darkness, gloom, despair, depression, feeling like God is distant, having those moments and times when you're praying and you feel like prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling and he seeds these thoughts in your mind that says, God's not listening to you. And you feel like you're separated from God. And then he also uses deadness, where he substitutes dead works for living godliness. All the good works that we do on this earth, God says they're like filthy rags. But when we live out in godliness, it's not. When we try to do things our way or man's way, and he convinces us, you can do it, you can fix this, you can resolve this, and he puts it all on you, 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 and you think all about I, 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 and then you leave out him. And the final one is probably the most deadly. It's delay. You can put it off till tomorrow. Tomorrow. I mean, hey, that person that's been on your heart and mind that you were thinking you should call and tell about Jesus, or that person you should challenge about their walk with God, you don't need to bother them with it today. I'm sure they're busy. So I'm sure you should just, you know, have a little procrastination and a little delay in life, because there will always be tomorrow, right? It was always said, don't put off to tomorrow what you can do today. So that means all of you have letters to write, emails to send, and people to phone when we finish here this morning. 
And if it's really that urgent, you can leave now. It's okay. okay. But procrastination, putting off a decision, the Apostle Paul, he's talking while he's under arrest to Felix and to King Agrippa. And they say there, well, maybe tomorrow. Maybe we'll talk to you some more about it tomorrow. We'll put this off. We don't have a record in Scripture of them coming to Christ. We don't know that they ever did. You see, the solution to all of these directions that Satan takes against us is faith. In the armor of God, God tells us to take up the shield of faith, which puts out all the fiery darts of the enemy. It's faith in God. It's faith in Christ alone. It's faith in trusting in him that in these circumstances and situations of life, when the devices of the enemy, and don't kid yourselves, he doesn't stop just because you beat him once. He doesn't stop just because, you know, you think you're on the right track. He keeps going and going and going. He's the ultimate evil energizer bunny. And if you think you're immune, just because you know Jesus, he didn't stop. He went right after Jesus. If you turn to Luke chapter 4, verse 1 to 13... In Luke 4, we see this account. We looked at it a little bit last week in the book of Matthew. (coughs) We looked at the three temptations that Jesus underwent. But I want you to focus specifically on the first verse of this account. Because it says at the start of this account in Luke chapter 4, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. Through the course of this temptation, the devil will tempt Jesus, but Jesus continually brings the truth of God's Word. He is the Word. He is the truth, but he still references the Old Testament prophets and passages that are there. And through Jesus' victory over the devil, when it tells us at the end... That when the devil had ended every temptation, verse 13, he departed from him until an opportune time. Interestingly enough, that means he wasn't totally finished yet. He just backed off until the opportune time, which would happen in the story through Judas Iscariot later on. But why did Jesus have victory? Well, number one, first of all, he's God. But Jesus gives us direction for our lives in terms of the victory that we can have. The victory for ourselves is, first of all, recognizing that in Jesus Christ, you have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Our advocate, our truth bearer, our deliverer, our protector, the one who prays on our half before God in groans that express beyond what we ourselves can express in our own prayers. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's interesting when you read back on Jesus' ministry, all of Jesus' time in ministry was Jesus and the Holy Spirit. It was a two-for-one deal. When he got baptized and the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove, that's what started his ministry. In other words, all that we get to do, all the good we get to do, all the God aspect of life we get to engage in is because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life that comes and seals upon us at the moment that we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and receive the forgiveness for our sins that he gives us. The other aspect that we see in Jesus is that he was fully centered on God. Well, of course he was. He was God, but he paints it for us that we need to keep our eyes and attention fully fixed on who God is. It was Paul in Hebrews, writing to the Hebrews, where he says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all these men and women of faith that have lived before us, he tells us to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and to run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Paul elsewhere says, fight the good fight of the faith. And then he tells us how to do it. He says, fix your eyes on Wow, you're not convinced. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes on him. Don't take your eyes off what he's done for you. Don't take your eyes off the fact that he is in heaven right now interceding for you before the Father. And he will be coming back again. Are you ready? Are you looking forward to him? Do you have your eyes fixed on that horizon? And are you living for that moment in time when he will come? 
Jesus was fully centered on the mission, will, and purpose of God. He says, it is my life to do the Father's will. That is my food, he said. That's my very essence, my being. What keeps me going is to do what God has called me to do. And to understand Jesus emphasized through all of his temptations with the devil, the fact that it is God's word of truth. We have it. It's in print. It's in many languages. It's available to everyone openly and freely. You can Google it. You can Bing it. You can Chrome it. You can buy it at the dollar store for a buck twenty-five. But there's no reason why anybody shouldn't be equipped with God's word or know how to use it. Jesus' victory over the devil was prophesied back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. After Adam and Eve had sinned and when God was giving his response to the different parts of that, the serpent, and to Adam and to Eve, he says to the serpent in chapter 3, verse 15, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Speaking there of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, where the devil thought he'd won. I killed the Son of God. Why doesn't it say Jesus crushed the serpent's head? Why does it say he only bruised his head? It's because the eternal destination of the devil is still waiting to come. We're going to get to that in a minute. But the reality of it is, is that it's the seed of the woman who will bruise the serpent's head. In other words, the devil is powerless against Christ. This bruising got accomplished by Christ's death and his resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, it tells us, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is the law. Our living by this world and what it has in it. But victory comes in Jesus. <coughs> In John chapter 12, verses 31 and 32, we are reminded of this victory in Jesus, the gospel of John. He tells us, beginning in verse 31, Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. And he told the crowd that the Son of Man must be lifted up. That was when Jesus accomplished it. You see, the reality we need to embrace, church, is this. The devil is a defeated foe, and he knows it. At present, his power is restricted and limited and only exercised by God's permission, as we have already seen. But there is an end coming, and you can see that end in Revelation chapter 20. We're just going to jump ahead for a brief look. We're not there yet in our series, but we will get to that. In Revelation chapter 20, it talks about the millennial reign of Christ, when Christ will come. It says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain, and he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. And then in verse 3b, it tells us that after the millennium, after Christ's reign for a thousand years, he will be loosed for a season, and there will be a final battle that comes in the world. It says, after that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection." Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And then jumping down to verse 10, in the final defeat of Satan, 
we see this, verse 7 to 10, it says, And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So you can know with certainty that there is an end in sight for the devil and for all those that reject God and God's purposes. The question that comes to us today, church, is this. So what are we supposed to do now? What's our role? What's our purpose? What's our duty as followers of Jesus Christ? In 1 Peter chapter 5, 8, it tells us to be sober, to be watchful. It tells us to stand firm. Ephesians 6 says, stand firm with the full armor of God upon yourselves. Do you know what standing firm means? It means don't engage. Don't go chasing after him. Don't go thinking, hey, Jesus, I got you. You're my sword. I'm going to go challenge the devil. Look at how the crusades turned out. Don't rebuke him. Don't rail against him. Don't speak evil of him. Do not engage because it's not your battle. We just sang about it, church. The battle belongs to the Lord. So when you're in those moments and you're in those circumstances and you're in <coughs> excuse me, those situations, turn it over to the Holy Spirit. Turn it over to our advocate, to our protector. The last aspect of putting on the armor of God says what? Pray without ceasing. Pray incessantly. Pray in the Holy Spirit on all occasions because it's God's battle. And I know this, he wins. He wins. Our duty as believers, though, too, is this. Don't be ignorant. Don't look at the world blindly. Don't think, well, hey, I, I, I'm good, I'm safe, I've got Jesus. The rest of the world is going on the way it goes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, we're given a wonderful verse. I know it'll be really long and hard for all of you to memorize. But if you can keep track of this one, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, it says, uh, Don't be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. In other words, don't play dumb. Don't think you know it all, but don't not think about his presence. Okay, You can't bury your head in the sand but also don't go hunting behind every bush for demons. Why? Because in the book of Ephesians, before Paul gets to talking about the armor of God, he talks about our life of godliness and how we're supposed to live for God. And then in Ephesians 4 verse 27, he tells us this. Give no opportunity to the devil. Give no opportunity. If there are things in your life that tempt you, stay away from them. Avoid them. Don't give him space or place in your life to work. Because if you have been redeemed and you are a child of God, you should know better. Knowing better and doing better are two different things. And James 4 verse 7 tells us, resist the devil and he will flee. What a fascinating statement, isn't it? Resist the devil and he will flee. Not optional, not questionable, because why? You're resisting the devil based on who? Jesus Christ, and you're standing with him as a child of God. Because in verse 7, it tells us before resisting the devil that you must submit yourselves, therefore, to God. 
You don't get to do the resisting on your own. It says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Why? Because of your submission to God and your submission to who God is. Not because you're capable of saying, hey, bring it on. It doesn't work like that. But in your life, you don't have to run scared. You don't have to run afraid. What you have to do is trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Because he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And I bet you never thought about the spiritual ramifications of that statement. He that is in you is greater than the ruler of this world. Greater than all the spiritual realities. Leave the running away for the devil. All right? And finally, meet him victoriously in the armor and strength and Holy Spirit of God. But that means that you need to know how to wield the sword of the Spirit. It means you need to read it. You need to memorize it. You need to hide the treasures of God in your heart so that you do not sin against him. It means you need to teach a young man the way he should go in God's word so that when he's old, he will not depart from it. You need to instruct people in what to do with God's word because God's word has a centering focus to every aspect of it. Every aspect of this book, every story, every prophecy, everything points to one thing, to being centered on God through Jesus Christ. You need to live your life Christ-centered, Because without Jesus, you have no hope. Without Jesus, you don't have a foundation to stand on. Your Matthew chapter 7's house on on the sandy shore with the wind and waves knocking you flat. But when you build your house on the rock and the world comes around you and the ruler of this world comes at you and the spiritual battles and physical battles come, you stand firm. Why? Because you're centered on Jesus. You need to be mission focused. You need to have your eyes set on the prize. Fight the good fight. Run for the prize. Live your life according to the way Jesus has told us to do it. He said, go into all creation and preach the good news. He told his disciples to teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. He said, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which means you need to bring people to a full understanding of who God is in our relationship with him, established by God the Father through Jesus the Son, and sealed on our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Because the commission of Christ to his disciples was not, well, hey guys, you know, if you feel like it today, maybe you can witness for me. The very last edict we have recorded of Jesus to his disciples was, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. You will be my witnesses. Go get one more. Go reach one more. Go tell one more. Your job is not to save people. Jesus did a good job of that already. Your job is to tell people that he has saved them. Provide them with the opportunity. And then even when Jesus told his disciples, you're going to be my witness, he says, yeah, but you're still not capable. He says, go wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you in full measure and power. Then you can be my witnesses. In other words, we need to rely fully on God. You have been given the Holy Spirit, so live empowered by God. The only choice you have here today, church, is whether you're on board or not. Are you going with God and headed in his direction? Do you have eternal life in heaven in your sights? Or are you rejecting it? There's only two roads. Jesus said there's a wide gate and a wide road, and there's many that find it, and it's the path to destruction. But he said narrow is the gate and narrow the path that lead to life, and few there are that find it. The unfortunate side of living in our world today is that there are far too many people who will flat out reject and stomp on the fact of what God has done for us in his love for us. So the question that you need to ask is the same question that David asked back in Psalm 139. And he asked the question at the end of the chapter 
of God based on what he knew from the start. He says in verse 1 of Psalm 139, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. And if we stopped right there, that's all you need to know about God's relationship to you. He has searched you and he knows you. He sees your thoughts, your heart. He goes on through that chapter to describe what God all knows about him from start to finish in every aspect. And then it's at the end of chapter 139 that he says this. This is the submission part to God. This is the part of coming before God and saying, God, I need you to make my life happen. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. God, this morning as we have engaged in your word, we do recognize that there is one who would try to keep us from our relationship with you. That he will use whatever device and measure he can to keep people from finding you and finding eternal hope and promise and experiencing the love and grace and mercy that you pour out to us. Lord, maybe even here this morning. There's someone that's been living with doubt and questioning that needs to make a decision. Like Joshua challenged the Israelites, God challenge our hearts today, choose this day who you will serve. And may it be the declaration of our hearts before you, God, that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So God, I do pray for us. I pray that you would search us. That you wouldn't let us just be idle in our life, Lord, but you would direct us. That, God, you would find us to be instruments of righteousness, a planting of the Lord, that you might be glorified, God, through our life and work and ministry and our engagement with this world. Because, Lord, beyond these doors, there's a world that desperately needs you. So commission us once again this morning, Lord. Commission us to live as servants of light, of ministers of grace, because we've experienced it from you firsthand, and we know what it is to be forgiven. And we ask you to lead and guide us in these days, Lord. There's lots of turmoil in the world. But it doesn't move you, because you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you. Thank you, our Father, for providing for us and guiding us and giving us truth. Thank you, Jesus, for coming, for redeeming us, for paying for our sin. And thank you, Holy Spirit, that you guide and direct us each day. Help us to be good listeners to your prompting in our life. Amen. see is the battle you see my victory when all I see is the mountain you see a mountain move as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me there's nothing to fear now for i am safe with you so when i fight i'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high oh god the battle be i
declaration. This is your celebration of who God is. So you declare it from your heart before him. You're recognizing who he is. So let's sing it out and shout it out because it's the truth for our lives unto eternity. from here today, church. Go knowing that you have a victorious, triumphant Savior that the Bible declares to us will come back in full authority with the sword of God streaming forth from his mouth because the truth of God will overcome all the power of the enemy once and for all. And we live for that day. So live it in the already not yet. You already know who wins. So live winning. Live together. Know that you're not on this earth by yourself. You have the church, a community of faith, and you also have, most importantly, Jesus Christ, your Savior, and the Holy Spirit with you. So go forth from here today, church, and let Jesus' light so shine through you that they see your Father in heaven and give him the glory. God bless you as you go.